Part 1 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 1 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Rent of the Land. Rent, considered as the price paid for the use of land, is naturally the highest which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. In adjusting the terms of the lease, the landlord endeavors to leave him no greater share of the produce than what is sufficient to keep up the stock from which he furnishes the seed, pays the labor, and purchases and maintains the cattle and other instruments of husbandry, together with the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood. This is evidently the smallest share with which the tenant can content himself without being a loser, and the landlord seldom means to leave him any more. Whatever part of the produce, or what is the same thing, whatever part of its price, is over and above this share, he naturally endeavors to reserve to himself as the rent of his land, which is evidently the highest the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land sometimes indeed the liberality more frequently the ignorance of the landlord makes him accept of somewhat less than this portion and sometimes too though more rarely the ignorance of the tenant makes him undertake to pay somewhat more or to content himself with somewhat less than the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighbourhood this portion however may still be considered as the natural rent of the land or the rent at which it is naturally meant that land should for the most part be let the rent of the land it may be thought is frequently no more than a reasonable profit or interest for the stock laid out by the landlord upon its improvement this no doubt may be partly the case upon some occasions for it can scarce ever be more than partly the case the landlord demands a rent even for unimproved land and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally an addition to this original rent those improvements besides are not always made by the stock of the landlord but sometimes by that of the tenant when the lease comes to be renewed however the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had been all made by his own he sometimes demands rent for what is altogether incapable of human improvements kelp is a species of seaweed which when burnt yields an alkaline salt useful for making glass soap and for several other purposes it grows in several parts of great britain particularly in scotland upon such rocks only as lie within the high water mark which are twice every day covered with the sea and of which the produce therefore was never augmented by human industry the landlord however whose estate is bounded by a kelp shore of this kind demands a rent for it as much as for his cornfields the sea in the neighbourhood of the islands of shetland is more than commonly abundant in fish which makes a great part of the subsistence of their inhabitants but in order to profit by the produce of the water they must have a habitation upon the neighbouring land the rent of the landlord is in proportion not to what the farmer can make by the land but to what he can make both by the land and the water it is partly paid in sea-fish and one of the very few instances in which rent makes a part of the price of that commodity is to be found in that country the rent of land therefore considered as the price paid for the use of the land is naturally a monopoly price it is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land or to what he can afford to take but to what the farmer can afford to give such parts only of the produce of land can commonly be brought to market of which the ordinary price is sufficient to replace the stock which must be employed in bringing them thither together with its ordinary profits if the ordinary price is more than this the surplus part of it will naturally go to the rent of the land if it is not more though the commodity may be brought to market it can afford no rent to the landlord whether the price is or is not more depends upon the demand there are some parts of the produce of land for which the demand must always be such as to afford a greater price than what is sufficient to bring them to market and there are others for which it either may or may not be such as to afford this greater price the former must always afford a rent to the landlord the latter sometimes may and sometimes may not according to different circumstances rent it is to be observed therefore enters into the composition of the price of commodities in a different way from wages and profit high or low wages and profit are the causes of high or low price high or low rent is the effect of it it is because high or low wages and profits must be paid in order to bring a particular commodity to market that its price is high or low 
but it is because its price is high or low a great deal more or very little more or no more than what is sufficient to pay those wages and profit that it affords a high rent or a low rent or no rent at all the particular consideration first of those parts of the produce of land which always afford some rent secondly of those which sometimes may and sometimes may not afford rent and thirdly of the variations which in the different periods of improvement naturally take place in the relative value of those two different sorts of rude produce when compared both with one another and with manufactured commodities will divide this chapter into three parts part one of the produce of land which always affords rent as men like all other animals naturally multiply in proportion to the means of their subsistence food is always more or less in demand it can always purchase or command a greater or smaller quantity of labor and somebody can always be found who is willing to do something in order to obtain it the quantity of labor indeed which it can purchase is not always equal to what it could maintain if managed in the most economical manner on account of the high wages which are sometimes given to labor but it can always purchase such a quantity of labor as it can maintain according to the rate at which that sort of labor is commonly maintained in the neighborhood but land in almost any situation produces a greater quantity of food than what is sufficient to maintain all the labor necessary for bringing it to market in the most liberal way in which that labor is ever maintained the surplus too is always more than sufficient to replace the stock which employed that labor together with its profits something therefore always remains for a rent to the landlord the most desert moors in norway and scotland produce some sort of pasture for cattle of which the milk and the increase are always more than sufficient not only to maintain all the labour necessary for tending them and to pay the ordinary profit to the farmer or the owner of the herd or flock but to afford some small rent to the landlord the rent increases in proportion to the goodness of the pasture the same extent of ground not only maintains a greater number of cattle but as they are brought within a smaller compass less labour becomes requisite to tend them and to collect their produce the landlord gains both ways by the increase of the produce and by the diminution of the labour which must be maintained out of it the rent of land not only varies with its fertility whatever be its produce but with its situation whatever be its fertility land in the neighbourhood of a town gives a greater rent than land equally fertile in a distant part of the country though it may cost no more labour to cultivate the one than the other it must always cost more to bring the produce of the distant land to market a greater quantity of labour therefore must be maintained out of it and the surplus from which are drawn both the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord must be diminished but in remote parts of the country the rate of profit as has already been shown is generally higher than in the neighbourhood of a large town a smaller proportion of this diminished surplus therefore must belong to the landlord good roads canals and navigable rivers by diminishing the expense of carriage put the remote parts of the country more nearly upon a level with those in the neighbourhood of the town they are upon that account the greatest of all improvements they encourage the cultivation of the remote which must always be the most extensive circle of the country they are advantageous to the town by breaking down the monopoly of the country in its neighbourhood they are advantageous even to that part of the country though they introduce some rival commodities into the old market they open many new markets to its produce monopoly besides is a great enemy to good management which can never be universally established but in consequence of that free and universal competition which forces everybody to have recourse to it for the sake of self-defence it is not more than fifty years ago that some of the counties in the neighbourhood of london petitioned the parliament against the extension of the turnpike roads into the remoter counties those remoter counties they pretended from the cheapness of labour would be able to sell their grass and corn cheaper in the london market than themselves and would thereby reduce their rents and ruin their cultivation their rents however have risen and their cultivation has been improved since that time a cornfield of moderate fertility produces a much greater quantity of food for man than the best pasture of equal extent though its cultivation requires much more labour yet the surplus which remains after replacing the seed and maintaining all that labour is likewise much greater if a pound of butcher's meat therefore was never supposed to be worth more than a pound of bread this greater surplus would everywhere be of greater value and constitute a greater fund both for the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord it seems to have done so universally in the rude beginnings of agriculture but the relative values of those two different species of food 
bread, and butcher's meat, are very different in the different periods of agriculture. In its rude beginnings the unimproved wilds, which then occupy the far greater part of the country, are all abandoned to cattle. There is more butcher's meat than bread, and bread, therefore, is the food for which there is the greatest competition, and which consequently brings the greatest price. At Buenos Aires, we are told by Ulloa, four reals, one and twenty pence halfpenny sterling, was, forty or fifty years ago, the ordinary price of an ox, chosen from a herd of two or three hundred. He says nothing of the price of bread, probably because he found nothing remarkable about it. An ox there, he says, costs little more than the labor of catching him. But corn can nowhere be raised without a great deal of labor, and in a country which lies upon the river plate, at that time the direct road from Europe to the silver mines of Potosi, the money price of labor could be very cheap. It is otherwise when cultivation is extended over the greater part of the country. There is then more bread than butcher's meat. The competition changes its direction, and the price of butcher's meat becomes greater than the price of bread. By the extension, besides, of cultivation, the unimproved wilds become insufficient to supply the demand for butcher's meat. A great part of the cultivated lands must be employed in rearing and fattening cattle, of which the price, therefore, must be sufficient to pay not only the labor necessary for tending them, but the rent which the landlord and the profit which the farmer could have drawn from such land employed in tillage. The cattle bred upon the most uncultivated moors, when brought to the same market, are, in proportion to their weight or goodness, sold at the same price as those which are reared upon the most improved land. The proprietors of those moors profit by it, and raise the rent of their land in proportion to the price of their cattle. It is not more than a century ago that in many parts of the highlands of Scotland, butcher's meat was as cheap or cheaper than even bread made of oatmeal. The Union opened the market of England to the highland cattle. Their ordinary price at present is about three times greater than at the beginning of the century, and the rents of many highland estates have been tripled and quadrupled in the same time. In almost every part of Great Britain, a pound of the best butcher's meat is, in the present times, generally worth more than two pounds of the best white bread, and in plentiful years it is sometimes worth three or four pounds. It is thus that, in the progress of improvement, the rent and profit of unimproved pasture comes to be regulated in some measure by the rent and profit of what is improved, and these again by the rent and profit of corn. Corn is an annual crop butcher's meat a crop which requires four or five years to grow as an acre of land therefore will produce a much smaller quantity of the one species of food than of the other the inferiority of the quantity must be compensated by the superiority of the price if it was more than compensated more corn land would be turned into pasture and if it was not compensated part of what was in pasture would be brought back into corn this equality however between the rent and profit of grass and those of corn of the land of which the immediate produce is food for cattle and of that of which the immediate produce is food for men must be understood to take place only through the greater part of the improved lands of a great country in some particular local situations it is quite otherwise and the rent and profit of grass are much superior to what can be made by corn thus in the neighborhood of a great town the demand for milk and for forage to horses frequently contribute together with the high price of butcher's meat to raise the value of grass above what may be called its natural proportion to that of corn this local advantage it is evident cannot be communicated to the lands at a distance particular circumstances have sometimes rendered some countries so populous that the whole territory like the lands in the neighborhood of a great town has not been sufficient to produce both the grass and the corn necessary for the subsistence of their inhabitants their lands, therefore, have been principally employed in the production of grass, the more bulky commodity, and which cannot be so easily brought from a great distance, and corn, the food of the great body of the people, has been chiefly imported from foreign countries. Holland is at present in this situation, and a considerable part of ancient Italy seems to have been so during the prosperity of the Romans. To feed well, old Cato said, as we are told by Cicero, was the first and most profitable thing in the management of a private estate, to feed tolerably well the second, and to feed ill the third. To plough he ranked only in the fourth place of profit and advantage. Tillage, indeed, in that part of ancient Italy which lay in the neighborhood of Rome, must have been very much discouraged by the distributions of corn which were frequently made to the people, either gratuitously or at a very low price.' 
This corn was brought from the conquered provinces, of which several, instead of taxes, were obliged to furnish a tenth part of their produce at a stated price, about sixpence a peck to the republic. The low price at which this corn was distributed to the people must necessarily have sunk the price of what could be brought to the Roman market from Latium, or the ancient territory of Rome, and must have discouraged its cultivation in that country. In an open country, too, of which the principal produce is corn, a well-enclosed piece of grass will frequently rent higher than any corn-field in its neighborhood. It is convenient for the maintenance of the cattle employed in the cultivation of the corn, and its high rent is, in this case, not so properly paid from the value of its own produce as from that of the corn lands which are cultivated by means of it. It is likely to fall, if ever the neighboring lands are completely enclosed. The present high rent of enclosed land in Scotland seems owing to the scarcity of enclosure, and will probably last no longer than that scarcity. The advantage of enclosure is greater for pasture than for corn. It saves the labor of guarding the cattle, which feed better too, when they are not liable to be disturbed by their keeper or his dog. But where there is no local advantage of this kind, the rent and profit of corn, or whatever else is the common vegetable food of the people, must naturally regulate upon the land which is fit for producing it, the rent and profit of pasture. The use of the artificial grasses, of turnips, carrots, cabbages, and the other expedients which have been fallen upon to make an equal quantity of land feed a greater number of cattle than when in natural grass, should somewhat reduce, it might be expected, the superiority which, in an improved country, the price of butcher's meat naturally has over that of bread. It seems accordingly to have done so, and there is some reason for believing that, at least in the London market, the price of butcher's meat, in proportion to the price of bread, is a good deal lower in the present times than it was in the beginning of the last century. In the appendix to the life of Prince Henry, Dr. Birch has given us an account of the prices of butcher's meat as commonly paid by that prince. It is there said that the four quarters of an ox, weighing six hundred pounds, usually cost him nine pounds ten shillings, or thereabouts. That is, thirty-one shillings and eight pence per hundred pounds weight. Prince Henry died on the 6th of November, 1612, in the nineteenth year of his age. In March, 1764, there was a parliamentary inquiry into the causes of the high price of provisions at that time. It was then, among other proof to the same purpose, given in evidence by a Virginia merchant, that in March, 1763, he had victualled his ships for twenty-four or twenty-five shillings the hundred weight of beef, which he considered as the ordinary price, whereas in that dear year he had paid twenty-seven shillings for the same weight and sort. This high price in 1764 is, however, four shillings and eight pence cheaper than the ordinary price paid by Prince Henry and it is the best beef only it must be observed which is fit to be salted for those distant voyages the price paid by prince henry amounts to three pence four-fifths per pound weight of the whole carcass coarse and choice pieces taken together and at that rate the choice pieces could not have been sold by retail for less than four and a half pence or five pence the pound in the parliamentary inquiry in seventeen sixty four the witnesses stated the price of the choice pieces of the best beef to be to the consumer four pence and four and a half pence the pound and the coarse pieces in general to be from seven farthings to two and a half pence and two and three quarter pence and this they said was in general one half penny dearer than the same sort of pieces had usually been sold in the month of march but even this high price is still a good deal cheaper than what we can well suppose the ordinary retail price to have been in the time of prince henry during the first twelve years of the last century the average price of the best wheat at the windsor market was one pound eighteen shilling three and a half pence the quarter of nine winchester bushels but in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year the average price of the same measure of the best wheat at the same market was two pound one shilling nine and a half pence in the first twelve years of the last century therefore wheat appears to have been a good deal cheaper and butcher's meat a good deal dearer than in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year in all great countries the greater part of the cultivated lands are employed in producing either food for men or food for cattle the rent and profit of these regulate the rent and profit of all other cultivated land if any particular produce afforded less the land would soon be turned into corn or pasture and if any afforded more some part of the lands in corn or pasture would soon be turned to that produce 
those productions indeed which require either a greater original expense of improvement or a greater annual expense of cultivation in order to fit the land for them appear commonly to afford the one a greater rent the other a greater profit than corn or pasture this superiority however will seldom be found to amount to more than a reasonable interest or compensation for this superior expense in a hop garden a fruit garden a kitchen garden both the rent of the landlord and the profit of the farmer are generally greater than an acorn or grass field but to bring the ground into this condition requires more expense hence a greater rent becomes due to the landlord it requires too a more attentive and skilful management hence a greater profit becomes due to the farmer the crop too at least in the hop and fruit garden is more precarious its price therefore besides compensating all occasional losses must afford something like the profit of insurance the circumstances of gardeners generally mean and always moderate may satisfy us that their great ingenuity is not commonly over recompensed their delightful art is practised by so many rich people for amusement that little advantage is to be made by those who practise it for profit because the persons who should naturally be their best customers supply themselves with all their most precious productions the advantage which the landlord derives from such improvements seems at no time to have been greater than what was sufficient to compensate the original expense of making them in the ancient husbandry after the vineyard a well-watered kitchen garden seems to have been the part of the farm which was supposed to yield the most valuable produce but democritus who wrote upon husbandry about two thousand years ago and who was regarded by the ancients as one of the fathers of the art thought they did not act wisely who enclosed a kitchen garden the profit he said would not compensate the expense of a stone wall and bricks he meant i suppose bricks baked in the sun mouldered with the rain and the winter storm and required continual repairs columella who reports this judgment of democritus does not controvert it but proposes a very frugal method of enclosing with a hedge of brambles and briars which he says he had found by experience to be both a lasting and an impenetrable fence but which it seems was not commonly known in the time of democritus palladius adopts the opinion of columella which had before been recommended by varro in the judgment of those ancient improvers the produce of a kitchen garden had it seems been little more than sufficient to pay the extraordinary culture and the expense of watering for in countries so near the sun it was thought proper in those times as in the present to have the command of a stream of water which could be conducted to every bed in the garden through the greater part of europe a kitchen garden is not at present supposed to deserve a better enclosure than that recommended by columella in great britain and some other northern countries the finer fruits cannot be brought to perfection but by the assistance of a wall their price therefore in such countries must be sufficient to pay the expense of building and maintaining what they cannot be had without the fruit wall frequently surrounds the kitchen garden which thus enjoys the benefit of an enclosure which its own produce could seldom pay for that the vineyard when properly planted and brought to perfection was the most valuable part of the farm seems to have been an undoubted maxim in the ancient agriculture as it is in the modern through all the wine countries but whether it was advantageous to plant a new vineyard was a matter of dispute among the ancient italian husbandmen as we learn from columella he decides like a true lover of all curious cultivation in favour of the vineyard and endeavours to show by a comparison of the profit and expense that it was a most advantageous improvement such comparisons however between the profit and expense of new projects are commonly very fallacious and in nothing more so than in agriculture had the gain actually made by such plantations been commonly as great as he imagined it might have been there could have been no dispute about it the same point is frequently at this day a matter of controversy in the wine countries their writers on agriculture indeed the lovers and promoters of high cultivation seem generally disposed to decide with columella in favour of the vineyard in france the anxiety of the proprietors of the old vineyards to prevent the planting of any new ones seems to favour their opinion and to indicate a consciousness in those who must have the experience that this species of cultivation is at present in that country more profitable than any other it seems at the same time however to indicate another opinion that this superior profit can last no longer than the laws which at present restrain the free cultivation of the vine 
In 1731 they obtained an order of council prohibiting both the planting of new vineyards and the renewal of these old ones, of which the cultivation had been interrupted for two years, without a particular permission from the king, to be granted only in consequence of an information from the attendant of the province, certifying that he had examined the land and that it was incapable of any other culture. The pretense of this order was the scarcity of corn and pasture and the superabundance of wine, but had this superabundance been real it would without any order of council have effectually prevented the plantation of new vineyards by reducing the profits of this species of cultivation below their natural proportion to those of corn and pasture with regard to the supposed scarcity of corn occasioned by the multiplication of vineyards corn is nowhere in france more carefully cultivated than in the wine provinces where the land is fit for producing it as in burgundy guienne and the upper languedoc the numerous hands employed in the one species of cultivation necessarily encourage the other, by affording a ready market for its produce. To diminish the number of those who are capable of paying it is surely a most unpromising expedient for encouraging the cultivation of corn. It is like the policy which would promote agriculture by discouraging manufacturers. The rent and profit of those productions, therefore, which require either a great original expense of improvement in order to fit the land for them, or a greater annual expense of cultivation, though often much superior to those of corn and pasture, yet when they do no more than compensate such extraordinary expense, are in reality regulated by the rent and profit of those common crops. It sometimes happens, indeed, that the quantity of land which can be fitted for some particular produce is too small to supply the effectual demand the whole produce can be disposed of to those who are willing to give somewhat more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent wages and profit necessary for raising and bringing it to market according to their natural rates or according to the rates at which they are paid in the greater part of other cultivated land the surplus part of the price which remains after defraying the whole expense of improvement and cultivation may commonly in this case and in this case only bear no regular proportion to the like surplus in corn or pasture but may exceed it in almost any degree, and the greater part of this excess naturally goes to the rent of the landlord. The usual and natural proportion, for example, between the rent and profit of wine and those of corn and pasture must be understood to take place only with regard to those vineyards which produce nothing but good common wine, such as can be raised almost anywhere, upon any light, gravelly, or sandy soil, and which has nothing to recommend it but its strength and wholesomeness. It is with such vineyards only that the common land of the country can be brought into competition, for with those of a peculiar quality it is evident that it cannot. The vine is more affected by the difference of soils than any other fruit tree. For some it derives a flavor which no culture or management can equal, it is supposed upon any other. This flavor, real or imaginary, is sometimes peculiar to the produce of a few vineyards, sometimes it extends through the greater part of a small district and sometimes through a considerable part of a large province the whole quantity of such wines that is brought to market falls short of the effectual demand or the demand of those who would be willing to pay the whole rent profit and wages necessary for preparing and bringing them thither according to the ordinary rate or according to the rate at which they are paid in common vineyards the whole quantity therefore can be disposed of to those who are willing to pay more which necessarily raises their prices above that of common wine the difference is greater or less according as the fashionableness and scarcity of the wine render the competition of the buyers more or less eager whatever it be the greater part of it goes to the rent of the landlord for though such vineyards are in general more carefully cultivated than most others the high price of the wine seems to be not so much the effect as the cause of this careful cultivation and so valuable a produce the loss occasioned by negligence is so great as to force even the most careless to attention a small part of this high price therefore is sufficient to pay the wages of the extraordinary labour bestowed upon their cultivation and the profits of the extraordinary stock which puts that labour into motion the sugar colonies possessed by the european nations in the west indies may be compared to those precious vineyards their whole produce falls short of the effectual demand of europe and can be disposed of to those who are willing to give more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent profit and wages necessary for preparing and bringing it to market according to the rate at which they are commonly paid by any other produce in cochin china the finest white sugar generally sells for three piastres the quintal about thirteen shillings and sixpence of our money as we are told by mr poive a very careful observer of the agriculture of that country 
what is there called the quintal weighs from a hundred and fifty to two hundred paris pounds or a hundred and seventy five paris pounds at a medium which reduces the price of the hundred weight english to about eight shillings sterling not a fourth part of what is commonly paid for the brown or muscovada sugars imported from our colonies and not a sixth part of what is paid for the finest white sugar the greater part of the cultivated lands in cochin china are employed in producing corn and rice the food of the great body of the people the respective prices of corn rice and sugar are there probably in the natural proportion or in that which naturally takes place in the different crops of the greater part of the cultivated land and which recompenses the landlord and farmer as nearly as can be computed according to what is usually the original expense of improvement and the annual expense of cultivation but in our sugar colonies the price of sugar bears no such proportion to that of the produce of a rice or corn field either in europe or america it is commonly said that a sugar planter expects that the rum and the molasses should defray the whole expense of his cultivation and that his sugar should be all clear profit if this be true for i pretend not to affirm it it is as if a corn farmer expected to defray the expense of his cultivation with the chaff and the straw and that the grain should be all clear profit we see frequently societies of merchants in london and other trading towns purchase waste lands in our sugar colonies which they expect to improve and cultivate with profit by means of factors and agents notwithstanding the great distance and the uncertain returns from the defective administration of justice in those countries nobody will attempt to improve and cultivate in the same manner the most fertile lands of scotland ireland or the corn provinces of north america though from the more exact administration of justice in these countries more regular returns might be expected in virginia and maryland the cultivation of tobacco is preferred as most profitable to that of corn tobacco might be cultivated with advantage through the greater part of europe but in almost every part of europe it has become a principal subject of taxation and to collect a tax from every different farm in the country where this plant might happen to be cultivated would be more difficult it has been supposed than to levy one upon its importation at the custom-house the cultivation of tobacco has upon this account been most absurdly prohibited through the greater part of europe which necessarily gives a sort of monopoly to the countries where it is allowed and as virginia and maryland produce the greatest quantity of it they share largely though with some competitors in the advantage of this monopoly the cultivation of tobacco, however, seems not to be so advantageous as that of sugar. I have never even heard of any tobacco plantation that was improved and cultivated by the capital of merchants who resided in Great Britain, and our tobacco colonies send us home no such wealthy planters as we see frequently arrive from our sugar islands. Though, from the preference given in those colonies to the cultivation of tobacco above that of corn, it would appear that the effectual demand of Europe for tobacco is not completely supplied, it probably is more nearly so than that for sugar and though the present price of tobacco is probably more than sufficient to pay the whole rent wages and profit necessary for preparing and bringing it to market according to the rate at which they are commonly paid in cornland it must not be so much more as the present price of sugar our tobacco planters accordingly have shown the same fear of the superabundance of tobacco which the proprietors of the old vineyards in france have of the superabundance of wine by act of assembly they have restrained its cultivation to six thousand plants supposed to yield a thousand weight of tobacco for every negro between sixteen and sixty years of age such a negro over and above this quantity of tobacco can manage they reckon four acres of indian corn to prevent the market from being overstocked too they have sometimes in plentiful years we are told by dr douglas i suspect he has been ill-informed burnt a certain quantity of tobacco for every negro in the same manner as the dutch are said to do of spices if such violent methods are necessary to keep up the present price of tobacco the superior advantage of its culture over that of corn if it still has any will not probably be of long continuance it is in this manner that the rent of the cultivated land of which the produce is human food regulates the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land no particular produce can long afford less because the land would immediately be turned to another use and if any particular produce commonly affords more it is because the quantity of land which can be fitted for it is too small to supply the effectual demand in europe corn is the principal produce of land which serves immediately for human food except in particular situations therefore the rent of corn land regulates in europe that of all other cultivated land britain need envy neither the vineyards of france nor the olive plantations of italy 
except in particular situations the value of these is regulated by that of corn in which the fertility of britain is not much inferior to that of either of those two countries if in any country the common and favourite vegetable food of the people should be drawn from a plant of which the most common land with the same or nearly the same culture produced a much greater quantity than the most fertile does of corn the rent of the landlord or the surplus quantity of food which would remain to him after paying the labour and replacing the stock of the farmer together with its ordinary profits would necessarily be much greater whatever was the rate at which labour was commonly maintained in that country this greater surplus could always maintain a greater quantity of it and consequently enable the landlord to purchase or command a greater quantity of it the real value of his rent his real power and authority his command of the necessaries and conveniencies of life with which the labour of other people could supply him would necessarily be much greater a rice field produces a much greater quantity of food than the most fertile corn field two crops in the year from thirty to sixty bushels each are said to be the ordinary produce of an acre though its cultivation therefore requires more labour a much greater surplus remains after maintaining all that labour in those countries therefore where rice is the common and favourite vegetable food of the people and where the cultivators are chiefly maintained with it a greater share of this greater surplus should belong to the landlord than in corn countries in carolina where the planters as in other british colonies are generally both farmers and landlords and where rent consequently is confounded with profit the cultivation of rice is found to be more profitable than that of corn though their fields produce only one crop in the year and though from the prevalence of the customs of europe rice is not there the common and favourite vegetable food of the people a good rice field is a bog at all seasons and at one season a bog covered with water it is unfit either for corn or pasture or vineyard or indeed for any other vegetable produce that is very useful to men and the lands which are fit for those purposes are not fit for rice even in the rice countries therefore the rent of rice lands cannot regulate the rent of the other cultivated land which can never be turned to that produce the food produced by a field of potatoes is not inferior in quantity to that produced by a field of rice and much superior to what is produced by a field of wheat twelve thousand weight of potatoes from an acre of land is not a greater produce than two thousand weight of wheat the food or solid nourishment indeed which can be drawn from each of those two plants is not altogether in proportion to their weight on account of the watery nature of potatoes allowing however half the weight of this root to go to water a very large allowance such an acre of potatoes will still produce six thousand weight of solid nourishment three times the quantity produced by the acre of wheat an acre of potatoes is cultivated with less expense than an acre of wheat the fallow which generally precedes the sowing of wheat more than compensating the hoeing and other extraordinary culture which is always given to potatoes should this root ever become in any part of europe like rice in some rice countries the common and favourite vegetable food of the people so as to occupy the same proportion of the lands in tillage which wheat and other sorts of grain for human food do at present the same quantity of cultivated land would maintain a much greater number of people and the labourers being generally fed with potatoes a greater surplus would remain after replacing all the stock and maintaining all the labour employed in cultivation a greater share of this surplus too would belong to the landlord population would increase and the rents would rise much beyond what they are at present the land which is fit for potatoes is fit for almost every other useful vegetable if they occupied the same proportion of cultivated land which corn does at present they would regulate in the same manner the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land in some parts of lancashire it is pretended i have been told that bread of oatmeal is a heartier food for labouring people than wheaten bread and i have frequently heard the same doctrine held in scotland i am however somewhat doubtful of the truth of it the common people in scotland who are fed with oatmeal are in general neither so strong nor so handsome as the same rank of people in england who are fed with wheaten bread they neither work so well nor look so well and as there is not the same difference between the people of fashion in the two countries experience would seem to show that the food of the common people in scotland is not so suitable to the human constitution as that of their neighbours of the same rank in england but it seems to be otherwise with potatoes the chairman porters and coal heavers in london and those unfortunate women who live by prostitution the strongest men and the most beautiful women perhaps in the british dominions are said to be the greater part of them from the lowest rank of people in ireland who are generally fed with this root 
no food can afford a more decisive proof of its nourishing quality or of its being peculiarly suitable to the health of the human constitution it is difficult to preserve potatoes through the year and impossible to store them like corn for two or three years together the fear of not being able to sell them before they rot discourages their cultivation and is perhaps the chief obstacle to their ever becoming in any great country like bread the principal food of all the different ranks of the people End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 1